Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Amen. We're back in the wilderness this week with John the Baptist, but our perspective changes a little bit. Last week, Mark's gospel gave us the God's eye view. We saw the whole thing play out, but without any dialogue or interactions. But this week, John's gospel drops us right into the thick of things, with John the Baptist facing off with the priests and the Levites. And with the scene painted this way, we see that the wilderness isn't just a place of new beginnings, it's also a place of questioning. The journey with Jesus on the desert superhighway isn't always going to be fun and games. There will be treacherous detours, potholes, and a whole lot of questions. Who are you, the messengers from Jerusalem asked John. Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? What do you say about yourself? People want to know what this is all about, John. Now, we might want to villainize these messengers and turn them into these interrogators from the temple inquisition, but they're just doing their job. You see, the bigwigs in Jerusalem had heard about John, and he piqued their interest, to say the least. Even though God hadn't spoken by the prophets in nearly 400 years, there was still hope that the Messiah would come, and John checked a lot of those boxes. So they send the priests and the Levites to get the scoop. Is John the Christ? John states it clearly, though. I, I am not the Christ, and he's not Elijah, and he's not the prophet. The messengers respond, okay, well, we've got to give an answer to the boss. You've said who you're not, so what do you say about who you actually are? And John explained, I am the voice crying out in the wilderness, make straight the Lord's way. But that doesn't stop the questioning. Why then are you baptizing, they ask, if you're not the Christ, Elijah, or the prophet? And this is where John starts to redirect them. I am baptizing with water, he says, but among you stands one you do not know. In other words, your questions are good, but you're asking the wrong guy. There's someone coming after me, And I'm not even worthy to take off his shoes. He is the one you need to get to know, John implies with his answer. So what we see here at at the center of this wilderness interrogation is the question of identity. John the Baptist had to be sure of his identity as the voice in the wilderness because people were questioning him and confusing him for the Messiah. The Messiah was coming and truly was already there, hidden in their midst. John's purpose, his identity, was to get their attention, to get them ready for when that random guy would be revealed as the Messiah. We ought to recognize that this identity and vocation was given by God. John didn't just sit down one day and decide to prepare the way. Even before he was conceived, God decided that he would be the forerunner for Jesus. And it was the same for Jesus. Jesus' identity as the Christ was determined long before he became man. But as we can see from today's reading, and really from Jesus' whole ministry, these identities will be called into question time and again. But John could confess with confidence who he was and what God had called him to do, because it didn't rest on his own decision. And another thing to note, too, is that this identity that John has was always in relation to Christ. When John confessed that identity, it was never something inherent in him. His identity totally depended on his proximity to Christ. Without Jesus, he had no identity. He would be completely unnecessary because there would be no one to get ready for. But with Christ, he was indispensable, and he brought hearts to repentance and prepared them to receive their Savior. This understanding of identity applies to us as well. Last week, we joined the crowds, went out into the wilderness, confessed our sins, and were baptized. 
And that baptism marked a new beginning in Christ, a journey with him through the wilderness world. But that baptismal new beginning also gave us a new identity in Christ. We didn't just join Team Jesus. He actually affected a change in who we are. No matter who you thought you once were, whether you proudly wore the badge of Pharisee or were a homeless guy who wandered out into the desert to hear the latest preacher, that didn't matter. You were identified as a sinner, plain and simple, separated from God, divided from his people. But God, but God in Christ came near in your baptism and washed away whatever other identity you found yourself with. He claimed you as his own. He clothed you with the garments of salvation and made you a child of God. And that's the only identity that matters. And that baptismal identity manifests itself in your life even now. It might seem like you should just put your head down, travel the wilderness path, and ignore the world because you're just passing through. But John reminds us that Christ is the light coming into the world. Present tense, not future tense. We live this life centered in his light, with eyes wide open. We're constantly looking for the ways Christ is brightening our dark night. As we move through this wilderness world, our God-given identity will constantly be challenged and called into question, just like it was for John. So we always ought to be prepared, like John, to make a confession of who we are in Christ. And we confess not only with our lips, but also with our actions. And that's where Paul's words to the Thessalonians show us what that looks like. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. Instead of griping and complaining, we learn that whatever experience we have, whether good or bad, is a cause for joy and prayer and thanksgiving to God. Because Christ is working through those to strengthen our identity in him. And hearing God's word too is essential to shaping that identity as well. Do not despise preaching, Paul says. All faithful preaching should point you to Christ. And that's your litmus test. That's how you test everything, like he says. If it's pointing you to somewhere other than Christ and his saving work, like to yourself or to the world or your works, then it's dangerous. But if it's directing you to the foot of the cross, then hold fast to it. Because that Christ-like suffering is part and parcel of the Christian identity. We also abstain from every form of evil. The devil has his ways and his methods, and he will do his best to use them to establish his own identity in you. That's the thing. He, he is always competing to push out the identity we have in Christ. So we resist his temptations with God's sanctifying power. He gives us the strength to keep from sinning and inspires us to participate in his blessings, in his word and sacraments. But the devil is very crafty. He will use any other identity to turn you against Christ. Your political identity, cultural, professional, generational, all of these types of identities abound, and the devil will use them to diminish your identity in Christ. It's true that we do hold various spots, stations in our life, but our first vocation and our only identity is as God's child. And if our jobs or activities or all the things we do get in the way of exercising that identity, then it's time for a wake-up call. Because only that one identity, the identity we have in Christ, gives us true and enduring joy and happiness. The others are always competing for first position, so there's always this underlying sense of fighting and fear. But our identity in Christ has won out. Because of him, we can live this life with perpetual joy and laughter. The Lord has done and continues to do great things for us. He is an endless source of life and light. We can always return to him with repentant hearts, and he will restore his identity in us. So 
as we wander here in the wilderness, do, don't fear the questioning and the confusion because Christ has given you his identity. It's an identity that's shaping your everyday existence, renewing you by repentance and faith, sanctifying you completely, all so that you will be found blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has called you, he is faithful to you, and he will surely do it. In the holy name of Jesus, amen.